say just a few things about myself and the organisation I'm uh, representing here and working for. Uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs is Britain's oldest free market think tank, set up in the 1950s by a fellow called Anthony Fisher. He made a fortune after the war uh, using his demob money to set up a busted chicken. So he's the man who invented the mass-produced chicken uh, and is responsible for turning chicken from being a luxury meat uh, into uh, a cheap and everyday one, uh, which saved the lives of a lot of rabbits, given that that was the cheap meat that it replaced apart from those few of us who still like rabbits and prefer it. Um, now, and uh, we are basically a free market think tank, as I say, which advocates the study of the use of markets to uh, see how they can be used to uh, solve social problems. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is the more general question, however, not just economics, as we'll see, but that of what libertarianism is. About myself, well, I'm actually a historian, uh, despite working for an organisation with economics in the title, although I have an interest in economics. Uh, it's history that is the discipline I originally come to. Uh, I live in Manchester, uh, although I work in London these days. Uh, I have a house in Manchester which is worth about 160,000 quid, which if I sold it would probably buy me a one-bedroom flat in Hackney if I was lucky. Uh, so uh, it just doesn't make sense for me to travel, move down south. I'm an example of the macroeconomic distortions uh, produced and driven by the planning system, in fact. Uh, I also uh, wouldn't like to do it for another reason, which is that I'm an ardent supporter of the Manchester football team, as opposed to the one from near Manchester that plays in red. Um, and uh, I have uh, done various things in my time. Uh, I've taught courses on history of crime, uh, history of the devil, uh, and a number of other subjects, including world history. Uh, but I've always had a long-term interest in classical liberalism, libertarianism, call it what you will. So what I want to do, as I said, is to say something about, well, what is libertarianism, and also what is it not? Uh, because this term seems to have a rather vague sort of definition in the contemporary British mind. Uh, when Facebook first came out a few years ago, being an American product, it only had like four particular kind of political opinions you could assign to yourself. Uh, one of which, however, was libertarian, which shows that in the United States, at any rate, uh, people had a rough idea of what the term means. Uh, over here in the United Kingdom, although the word is beginning to achieve some currency, uh, it hasn't yet achieved that kind of general recognition as a kind of distinct and recognisable uh, political position. And a lot of people still seem to think that it's a shorthand for selfish bastard, basically, uh, which is something I, I hope shows not uh, something else, in fact. Uh, so there is a distinct position, uh, and I want to explain what it is, but also say what it's not. One of the things that should come out from my remarks is that it's not the same thing as free market conservatism. Uh, that's a different and distinct political uh, position. Uh, and it's also not the same as certain kinds of uh, libertarian socialism, uh, again, for other reasons I think should become obvious. Before I do go on, I should say something about the nature of the word itself, because I'm not actually a fan of the word. Uh, it's an ugly word. Um, it's also uh, a word which has a distinct history. For anyone who knows anything about the history of the word, it means that you're an anarchist. Uh, libertarian historically meant a communist anarchist of the Peter Popkin variety. Uh, and uh, that's why they get very upset that the word has now been taken away from them. Uh, and it is true that some libertarians are anarchists, but not all of them are. And so it's a bit misleading. Uh, I sometimes use the term classical liberal, which I do prefer, but there are problems with that term as well, uh, mainly to do with the fact that it implies that what you're dealing with is some kind of old doctrine or way of thinking about the world that's been preserved in aspic, uh, whatever aspic is. Uh, and which has not really evolved or changed much in the last hundred years or so. In fact, that's not true. What you're talking about here is a very active and live intellectual tradition, which is still developing, in fact, in all kinds of interesting ways right now. Uh, I think, really, we ought to go back uh, to the original term that was applied to this way of thinking about the world when it first came to be formulated, uh, which is individualism. Uh, I think that that term has all kinds of advantages. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it's not been used really in that way since the early 1950s for complicated reasons. Uh, so we have to talk about libertarianism. So what is it? Well, the first thing to grasp about libertarianism is that, like most of the major political philosophies of our time, it's a modern doctrine. You will not find people advocating libertarian ideals really in a systematic way before, at the very earliest, the very late 18th or the early 19th century. Like modern conservatism and socialism, it's one of those ideas, ways of thinking about the world and about politics, that springs out of the Enlightenment. So we're talking here about a post-Enlightenment philosophy. There are people in earlier periods, uh, including several not in Europe, by the way, notably a number of thinkers in late Ming China, who advocate something very similar to 
contemporary libertarianism. Uh, the uh, school of Confucian thought that follows Wang Yangming in uh, early 17th century China has a number of thinkers who are very close to this position. But uh, when you put them into their historical context and understand where they're coming from, the Confucian tradition, uh, it's really a bit anachronistic to say that they are libertarians in the way a modern thinker would be. So we're dealing with a modern philosophy. That's the first thing to realise here. What we're dealing with here is a political position which essentially is an answer to the question, how should the modern world be organised? And how should the modern world uh, see itself and how should it run its affairs? Second thing to realise, and this is the crucial point, is that libertarianism is a political philosophy. It is not anything more than that. Essentially, it's a doctrine, an argument about how politics, uh, public affairs, should be organised, about the nature of law, the nature of political power, the nature of government, the nature of governance, if you will. It is not a comprehensive or total philosophy. In other words, libertarians, what they agree about, what makes them a coherent body of people, however they may disagree on the nuances, is a common or shared view about the nature of politics uh, and the limitations of politics. They do not share views about the whole range of other kind of questions that philosophy is concerned with. They do not share views, for example, about what the good, the beautiful and the true are. Uh, they do not share ideas about the way that you ought to live uh, or what a good life consists of. So, unlike, say, Roman Catholicism, uh, it's not a comprehensive philosophy of life uh, which seeks to answer questions about a whole range of aspects of human life, such as what the point or purpose of life is. In fact, a central feature of the libertarian position is that it deliberately avoids giving answers to those kind of questions, particularly the one I just alluded to, the one about people like what the point of life is, because a central part of the argument is that each person has to decide for themselves what the point of their life is. Be. There is no kind of uh, position about what it should be, unlike, as I say, for example, most religious philosophies. So that's the first thing to grasp about what I'm going to be talking about here. We are not talking here about a kind of comprehensive philosophy that covers morals, ethics, aesthetics, and a whole range of other things. We're talking about a philosophy which is purely and simply about politics and the use and nature of power. The uh, second thing also to sort of grasp about this. Um, is that it does not have a single foundation. A lot of libertarians, I'm afraid, the sectarian ones, uh, will give you the impression that libertarian conclusions about politics derive from and are founded upon a particular basis of some kind or other. And the common argument that's made by people like this afterwards is that if you don't share that basis, then you're not a true libertarian. So there's a kind of sectarian quality to this. Now, what are some of the bases that have been advocated? Well, for some people, it's a kind of Lockean doctrine of natural rights. You find this also in Robert Nozick, for example. Locke, Nozick, a lot of American libertarians draw their conclusions about politics from a presumption about the existence of natural rights in a certain way. So the opening sentence of Anarchy State of Utopia, Nozick's famous book, of course, is all human beings have rights. Uh, that's, that's his initial premise, which he does not bother to defend more articulate in other ways. Other people, on the other hand, such as uh, David Friedman, and before him his father, Milton Friedman, uh, base their libertarian conclusions on utilitarianism, usually the John Stuart Mill right. Uh, so there's a whole kind of body of libertarians who say that essentially libertarianism is the way to maximise human well-being, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. There are yet others who derive it from virtue ethics, essentially from uh, a form of argument about what is necessary to lead the good life. And this is a kind of Aristotelian basis for libertarianism. Uh, there are others who have even other foundations. My own favourite group, who have now died out, were the Gallimbosians, um, whose arguments about libertarianism came from a truly bizarre view about intellectual property. Uh, this was the belief that intellectual property was the same as any other kind of property, which meant, amongst other things, uh, that you could not talk about, for example, the American Declaration of Independence uh, unless you first paid royalties to the estate of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and I do remember the bizarre experience of being at libertarian gatherings in the 70s or early 80s, where young, earnest Americans usually would come up to you and say, I have this theory which explains how the whole world works, and if we put it into effect, it will create a perfect world, war, poverty will all vanish, and everyone will live a life of perfect happiness. You'd say, sounds good. What is it? You'd say, oh, I can't tell you. <laughs> because I hadn't 
paid the royalties to, uh, Andrew Gallimbos. Um, so that was another rather bizarre and eccentric uh, form of uh, libertarianism. Uh, I did actually eventually read Gallimbos' book, um, and it made me, it convinced me completely that intellectual property is an incoherent idea in the politics, basically. Uh, because the argument was logically impeccable and utterly rigorous, but the conclusions were barking mad, basically. Uh, so it was a classic reductio ad absurdum. I concluded that if the argument led logically to such completely nonsensical conclusions, then the premise must be uh, wrong, basically. But my point is, though, which I, uh, that, to go to a main point here, that you cannot, you should not think of libertarianism as being something that is necessarily tied up with a particular foundational starting point. It's not simply and only uh, an outgrowth of utilitarianism or an outgrowth of natural rights theory or an outgrowth of anything else. It may in individual cases derive from all of those things, although I actually think in more often, more often what's happened is that people have arrived at libertarian conclusions or analyses and then they work backwards to try and find a philosophical foundation. Uh, but, but I think this foundationalism actually is a bit of a waste of intellectual time, but that's another matter. Uh, but my point is that you don't need to think that it has that. So that's a very important thing. So what is it then? Uh, if it's not something that has a particular foundation, you can't think of it in foundationist terms. And if it's not something that is a comprehensive uh, or total philosophy of the world, it's a political philosophy, what is it? Well, very simply, the core premise, if you will, is the argument or assertion that the role of power and force in human life, and in particularly public life, should be kept to a minimum. Uh, in other words, it's the argument that voluntary relations between human beings, relations based upon consent, should be the norm and the default position. And that you should seek, uh, at almost any cost really, to minimise involuntary, coercion-based, power-based relations between human beings. Now this obviously raises all sorts of interesting and difficult issues, like the degree to which circumstances can be held to be coercive. Uh, does the concept of coercion, force, and power necessarily imply conscious will and intention, for example? Or can we say that circumstances such as poverty are in some sense coercive? That's, that's one of the big issues that this whole position throws up. Um, it also raises the interesting question of um, how far uh, relations, for example, within the family or within private institutions such as uh, firms or uh, companies of one kind or another can also uh, come under the rubric of power relations and be seen to be coercive in the same way as political relations. And this is, an, this is one of the current big issues amongst libertarian thinkers, actually. There's quite an argument going on about that very particular issue, particularly in the United States. So I'll return to that point later on. But that's the crucial sort of basic uh, argument. Now, this has, I would say, three major corollaries, which, if you like, form essentially to simplify enormously the basic part of libertarian political thinking. The starting point, therefore, as I say, is that you want to minimise the role of force and power in human affairs. First corollary of that is that, therefore, government, which is almost by definition force-based relations, should be minimal. Uh, government, the state, is classically defined by Weber as being the institution that has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force in a specified territory. Uh, so the use of force is of the essence of government as a human institution and of governance as a human activity. So if your position and political philosophy is that you should minimise the role of coercion, uh, then uh, you are going to want to minimise the role of government. And I put it that way, rather than the state, because I think it's an, you know, um, the state in some ways is a kind of historically contingent phenomenon. We have had government ever since at least the advent of agriculture in most parts of the world. Uh, the state with a capital S is something that really only appears in the, uh, at the very earliest, the 17th century, I would argue, in various ways, both intellectually and in practical terms. So first of all then, we're talking about minimal government. The second thing which follows on from this is that the power that government has, or that, to be more precise and exact, the people who constitute the government have, is delegated. Uh, in other words, you do not have, uh, libertarianism explicitly rejects the idea that the people who exercise power over others for whatever reason gain that power from some source other than that of the delegation of consent of the people over whom the power is exercised. 
Uh, so the argument is that the source of the power of uh, agency, government is essentially that of agency. They are people like presidents, prime ministers, uh, other government officials and the like, are essentially exercising power which we have handed over them to exercise on our behalf. Now you could then get into lots of secondary arguments about how this is done. Is it done purely on the basis of individuals delegating their authority, which is Locke's position for example, uh, or do we have some entity called we the people uh, who hand over the Power, which is what the United States Constitution uh, presumes. That then leads to lots of arguments about how you define what the people is. Very interesting arguments, obviously, uh, historically. But the ultimate point that the power is delegated uh, remains. Now, um, very conveniently, um, we've just had a classic example of the opposite view here. Uh, you may you must have noticed, although I, to my shame, didn't notice until very late yesterday, that uh, the Pope has handed his notice in. Uh, which I must say is very strange. I always thought that I'd drunk for life, actually. I thought that was a whole idea, uh, but apparently not. Um, and uh, I, I was wondering, you know, all day yesterday, why is all these people on Twitter saying they're going to run for Pope? And then somebody told me, that. haven't you heard? You know? uh, and all the news bulletins said that he resigned, which irritated me intensely, because uh, being a stickler for accuracy in words, the correct term, of course, is that he's abdicated. Now, what is the difference, and why does that annoy you, and why is it relevant to what I'm saying in the delegate? Power. Well, if you, if you resign, then what that means is that you hold a role in which you are given delegated power by somebody who is over you in some sense. And when you resign, you hand back the power that's been delegated to you. You resign your office. Now, who is the Pope responsible to? Well, God, actually. Uh, and so you can't resign because the power he has, uh, the powers of deciding doctrine and all the other powers that the Pope exercises in the Catholic Church, they don't come from any earthly source, they come from outside, from society, from God. So therefore, uh, you can only abdicate. The same is true, of course, of kings. That's why kings abdicate, because again, the power they have does not come from their subjects, it comes from outside the people, yeah, from God, and so the only thing to do is step down to abdicate. So the words actually reveal a difference, and that shows you the two different ideas of how political power uh, arises. Today, very few people are robust enough uh, to think that uh, in their thinking to argue the case for uh, divine right or some other mystical notion of where power comes from. We all tend to believe in some notion of popular sovereignty, but most people don't think through what that actually means because of a lot of mystification of it. So that's the, first, that's the second point. So the first point is that the, the role of government is minimal. You want to reduce government to the smallest extent possible, and some libertarians go all the way and say that therefore you should be an anarchist and not have any government. Uh, some of the change, I think the majority actually think just that you need a minimal government. They say that there is some necessary role for coercion of human affairs, but it should be as small as possible. Uh, and secondly, the power to exercise that coercive power is what is ultimately delegated. It does not come from outside the voluntary consent of the people over whom it is exercised. The final, so the third major corollary that flows from the initial premise is that, and this is a very important one, is that governments, people with power, should not distinguish between different notions of the good life. Uh, in other words, it is not the role of government and political power to promote one way of living, uh, one kind of life, over others. Uh, you have to realise what a radical statement that is, historically. Uh, generally speaking, most political philosophers thought, until the late 18th century, that perhaps the central role of government and political power was precisely to promote the good. Uh, the problem, of course, was that there was lots of dispute about what the good was. Uh, and this led to lots of unpleasantness, like civil war and religious persecution. But the fact that government was there to make people obey the commands of virtue, to live in a certain way, and to try to realise a particular idea of what the good life was, that was not in dispute. Most people thought it was self-evident that that was what the job of people with political power was. Now, by contrast, libertarians argue that the government should not make distinctions between different ways of living. That it should lead people <coughs> to choose what their way of living is on a number of bases. One of them being that most people are, generally speaking, the best judge of their own interests, which is Milton's famous argument, for example. Now, you may think this is a, an OTO's argument, because who does think that these days? Well, lots of people. Uh, so, you know, governments these days apparently seem to think, or the political class increasingly seem to think, uh, that it's part of their responsibility to influence by various means the kind of diet that we have, uh, or whether or not we take enough exercise. 
uh, or other features of our personal life, there are very strong notions held that there's a certain way of living that's the right way to live and that the government should be using various powers, the tax power, other powers, in order to try and at least nudge us uh, or even overtly coerce us into living in a certain way to realise a certain life. Some people are more honest and consistent. <coughs> Peter Hitchens, uh, I don't know who he is, a columnist of the Daily Mail, I do like Peter actually, although he's barking mad in my view. Um, Peter is very explicit about this. He, the reason why he thinks that um, there should be a war on drugs, and he thinks that we've not been fighting them yet, which is news to all those people who are in prison at the moment, but there you go. Um, Peter thinks that the reason why we should have a war on drugs is because taking drugs is immoral, <coughs> and taking drugs is a bad way of living. I could actually agree with that, I probably do actually. Uh, but he then goes on to argue that one of the central roles of government is to stop people leading a self destructive and bad way of life and get them to lead a good way of life. And that's the point that the, the argument that libertarians fundamentally and basically reject. Uh, so that's, a third, that's <laughs> the third key element. So those are the three kind of key elements of libertarian thinking, if you will. Minimal government, uh, all political power is strictly limited and delegated, and government does not make distinctions between one version of the good life and others. It allows for free choice of others. And it also means, of course, allowing people to do things which are self-destructive. So, you know, if you're like George Best and you reckon that, uh, you know, spending all your money on, on drink and women is useful and the rest of it is just wasted, uh, then, you know, you let people go ahead and do this. Uh, and you, know, you may regret the choices they've made, uh, but they've not done it. Uh, and I remember when Amy Winehouse uh, died recently, there was lots of stuff in the press about how she was a victim. And I personally thought that was highly offensive, actually, not least to her because she chose to live the way she had. But this was my thinking, it was self-destructive and not very good for a woman of her talents, but, you know, that was what she wanted to do, that was the course of life she chose. So to say that she was a victim, which implied that you know, she'd not chosen this somehow, I thought was, was offensive as well as inaccurate. So, um, what does, uh, what then follows on from this? Well, I'm sure some of you begin to think, think about something. And that is, um, what about economics? Because surely when most people think of libertarianism, uh, they think it means free market economics. Well, yes, but not in the straightforward way that people think. What libertarianism means is that you can't have certain kinds of political economy. You can't have a political economy which gives a major role to the state. So you can't have a planned economy or for that matter, the kind of social democratic public economy, which is the dominant form in most developed countries today. A co you can't have, for example, a political economy in which the state decides how 50% of the national income is spent, which is what we have here in the UK. Because that certainly is minimal government, and it's certainly not minimising the role of power in public affairs. On the other hand, it doesn't follow from this that therefore you support capitalism. It certainly doesn't follow that you should support the status quo economically. Uh, and you know, if given the extent of power of government in the modern world, which libertarians deplore, uh, a large part of contemporary capitalism is also something they would deplore because it consists essentially uh, of people using political power for their own private advantage, uh, which in some ways is even worse than using it for some uh, supposed public good, although the effects are often the same. So, some libertarians do support what you can broadly define as capitalism, but not all of them. There are also what you might call left libertarians who support some other kind of economy. John Stuart Mill, for example, who's undoubtedly one of the great libertarians in my view, uh, was someone who, towards the end of his life, certainly thought that we should have an economy, a laissez-faire economy with a minimal government, but in which there was no wage labour and no rent. So he favoured an economy essentially consisting of uh, worker cooperatives. His argument was that uh, labour should hire capital rather than the other way around. That was the way he put it in his autobiography and elsewhere. Similarly, there are mutualists, for instance, uh, who follow the kind of argument made by Proudhon. Uh, you are no doubt know that Proudhon famously said property is theft. What you may not know is that in the same book, Proudhon later on said property is freedom, and then he finally ended up by saying property is impossible. So it's a practical. <laughs> Uh, you know, contradictory. Uh, but in fact, if you actually read the book, which almost nobody has done, I'm afraid, um, the, what you realise is that Proudhon was distinguishing between two different kinds of property, one which he thought was legitimate and one which he thought was not, and he liked the legitimate form. 
Uh, and so, but the point is that there are libertarians who basically follow the kind of political economy that Proudhon and his followers advocated, so-called mutualism, uh, which is again a free market economy, certainly, but not a capitalist one. So if you want to talk about the economics that follows on from these positions, what it implies is certainly a free market economy. It implies an economy in which you have free exchange, in which people are free to exchange goods, make contracts with each other uh, on as free and unrestricted basis as possible. Uh, the only kind of, um, you know, there are certain limitations on the kind of contracts you can enter into for most of the times anyway, uh, but these are very, very minimal. But it does not follow from that that you necessarily have or end up with an economy or a political economy that is like the one we have now, or even a kind of more purified capitalist economy. It's perfectly consistent with libertarian principles to advocate a different kind of political economy, and many people do. So that's, that's one of the obvious um, uh, things there. Uh, there's a number of other things that follow on from this. Uh, one of them, of course, is that there's support for free trade, one of the kind of quintessential uh, libertarian <coughs> political and economic positions. Uh, free trade is a much more radical idea than most people realise, uh, because essentially the argument is that economic relations should pay no attention to national borders, to geopolitical frontiers. The essential insight or argument is that a trade or exchange relationship between somebody living in Durham and somebody living in Somerset is no different from a trade relation between somebody in Durham and somebody <coughs> in China or somebody in Japan. The fact that one of them crosses a geopolitical border and the other doesn't is completely relevant to this way of thinking. Because to make it relevant is to apply political power in an area where it's not appropriate. Uh, and this basically undercuts an enormous amount uh, of actual real-world existing uh, regulation and government control. It's also saying it dissolves a lot of national borders. That's why another one of the uh, corollaries of this position, economic corollaries and social corollaries of this position, is that you should have open borders uh, and that you should not have any of this damn nonsense we have to put up with these days uh, when you just have to go across a geopolitical border you have to produce an ident form of identification and put up with being asked all sorts of questions by somebody who's obviously being bred on a special farm. Um, <laughs> I came to the conclusion that certainly in the United States they must have a special farm in North Dakota where they produce all their you know, border security people. Uh, and the part of the procedure is to have a sense of humour removal procedure. <laughs> uh, but this, this is generally the case every, everywhere, actually. And since we've got Martin here from you know, the Antipodes, I should mention that one of the worst examples of this is this show we have on British television about Australian border guards uh, and about how they protect Australia from the dreadful thing of people who want to come into Australia from outside and work there uh, or bring in cooked Indonesian food and this kind of thing. Um, and the, one of the most striking things about them is the utter, total lack of any sense of humour or proportion on the part of these people. Uh, and what we often realise, don't realise, is how reasonable this is. Uh, in 1914, for example, there were only two countries in Europe that required you to have a passport for entry. Uh, and those were the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire. And everyone else thought that showed how backward those two countries were. Uh, and the requirement of a passport was one of the many bad things that came in with World War I. Uh, and nowadays people just think it's perfectly normal and natural that you should have to put up with all kinds of impertinent and personal questions when you want to make a journey around the world. Uh, so, I mean, that's another uh, part of the uh, consequences, if you will, or economic and other policies of the kind of doctrines I'm mentioning. Uh, and there, of course, there are many others, some of which are generally taken for granted these days or we shouldn't take for granted, others of which are still very controversial. So it implies, for example, that you should have complete religious toleration, uh, which we think is an obvious or straightforward doctrine, but which most of our ancestors thought was monstrously wicked. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the general view of most well-thinking well people in Europe, certainly, until really the middle of the 19th century was that religious toleration was a monstrously evil doctrine. Uh, when you think about their premises, this makes perfect sense. Because if you believe that if you have the wrong religious beliefs, you're going to go and burn in hell forever, which means you're going to suffer pain worse than the human mind can imagine for eternity, then to allow people to spread bad religious ideas which will lead people to suffer this fate is an incredibly bad thing to do. Uh, and so it makes perfect sense to persecute heretics and not allow religious freedom uh, on that basis. So religious toleration is one of them. Uh, another of them is what you might call freedom of lifestyle, uh, which John Stuart Mill, of course, famously advocates in his great essay on liberty. Uh, this means, amongst other things, for example, the state should not be involved in marriage, uh, which is uh, you know, a completely orthogonal position to the current debate we're having as to whether or not to extend the right of state marriage to 
uh, different categories, such as gay, gay men and women, uh, the sort of libertarian position will be that this is not an area where you, political power should be involved, uh, which means that you should simply have private contracts and agreements. So if people want to privately contract to have uh, you know, a marriage, which if only have a multiple marriage, or one of the fancy kinds of marriages that Robert Heinemann talks about in some of his science fiction, then that's entirely up to them, as long as the laws that have been set into the laws of contract uh, are enforced. Uh, so again, another example is it means that uh, the catastrophic war on drugs and other forms of prohibition uh, are simply ruled out of the court uh, for both utilitarian and other reasons. That doesn't mean necessarily that you don't think, as I said earlier, uh, that uh, certain lifestyles or lifestyle choices are not self-destructive and disastrous uh, for the people who make them. It just means that if you do think that, you are not able to use political power to try and realise your end of getting people to do less of it. You have to find some other way of doing it. Uh, and historically, I think actually have been other ways of doing it, which have proved to be more effective. Uh, so that's what all that, that, that's what I would say libertarianism is essentially. It's a political doctrine, as I said at the start, uh, which has those three main elements: minimal government, because that minimises the role of courts most dramatically. Um, delegate the fact that all power, as far as it does exist, should be delegated rather than uh, sourced from sort of outside source, uh, and that uh, government should not distinguish between different parts of the good life. As I say, in terms of political economy, this means that certainly you have to have a voluntary free market economy, but what kind of free market economy you have is up for grabs, really. There are all kinds of arguments you can have there. Now, a couple of things finally to conclude. One of them is, um, I alluded to debates that are going on. What are the big arguments that are going on around with libertarians? Uh, why do I say that this is a living philosophy and not simply a preserved old one? Well, the big argument at the moment, essentially, uh, is over precisely this question of what is the most appropriate political economy for um, libertarians to support. Uh, and in particular, it centers around the question of how to evaluate and how to judge private power uh, as compared to public power. Two kinds of arguments which I think are very interesting are being made at the moment. I'll just flag them up to you. Uh, the first is uh, an extension of Hayek's critique of government to other institutions. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, who's probably, I think, the most important uh, libertarian thinker of the last uh, 100 years, certainly, uh, basically produced a critique of government based upon his idea of what, what he called the knowledge problem. The fact that uh, the knowledge that human beings have in a large, complex society such as ours is enormously large but incredibly scattered and diffuse. Uh, it's broken up and shared. Each, each one of us has a tiny, minuscule fragment of the total body of knowledge. Not only that, but much of the knowledge that we have is incapable of being articulated or written down, uh, which means that you can't capture it, even if you were to go around everybody and ask them to tell you what it was. Uh, and the result is that, therefore, large government planning or large-scale attempts to manipulate uh, public affairs through public policy are doomed to be counterproductive and to fail, I think, because they can't get around the knowledge problem. Now, one of the things that's beginning to be uh, pointed out is that Hayek's uh, argument is a critique not just of government, but of large hierarchical institutions in general. So it's a critique which applies as much to really large firms, for example, as it does to government. It's just that, from a Hayekian perspective, the problems in large firms are less acute because they're smaller than government. And also, there's a corrective mechanism to some degree uh, in the case of firms because they're embedded in a market economy which provides the check of profit and loss to the extent that that's allowed to operate. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't serious problems. I think uh, you, you can see how this was working in a number of uh, large institutions recently, such as large banks, for example, where one of the things that becomes obvious if you actually really count what's going on in the City of London and Wall Street and elsewhere was that the senior executives of large banks just had no idea what the hell was going on. Uh, and that's really a classic example of the knowledge problem and how it works out in a large organisation. The other is the question I alluded to earlier, which is that of how relations within, say, a firm might constitute power relations. Um, there's a, a group of people over in the United States whom I'm sympathetic to called Bleeding Hearts Libertarians, a well-known blog by that name. Uh, one of the leading figures in it is friend Michael Jacob Levy. Uh, Jacob recently published a large post this, and he invited comments from a number of people, including a woman called Elizabeth Anderson, who is a very well-known philosopher. Uh, she, she wrote a book, uh, I think in terms of the rigor of its arguments, uh, a very good book about the role and scope of market relations and whether or not we should limit them. Uh, and she thinks we should limit them, basically. She thinks there are a number of kind of transactions and relations that we should not 
turned into market relations. The kind of view that Michael Sandel has been putting, but unlike Sandel, she's a good philosopher. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I, can't, I can't work out quite why, why uh, you know, he gets all the kudos on uh, Elizabeth Anderson and Deborah Sachs, who have both made the same argument much more effectively with higher quality data. But anyway, she commented on this, and she made two comments, one of which I thought was basically just silly. The other, which was very quite profound and penetrating, I thought. The first one was she said, well, you've got to have all these regulations to stop private actors exploiting their customers and so on, which I think just shows elementary ignorance of economics. But the other comment was that there are all kinds of power relations in private institutions which constrain real human agency, and that you can't simply say these are consensual in the way that uh, a lot of libertarians try to. And I think that point was very well taken. And that's where a lot of the argument is now, is now going on. So right now, there are big arguments going on precisely about uh, what exactly the nature of power is and how to tweak out power relations in other circumstances. Another argument that's going on, just to again flag it up to you, is over what the nature of the modern state is uh, and why the modern state has the qualities it does and appears when it did, and whether or not there's any way of getting out of it. Um, this draws largely on the work of a fellow called James Scott, James C. Scott, who... Uh, is a political scientist, not in the tech, but has written a couple of very interesting books on this topic, particularly his most recent one, Living Without the State, which I recommend to you very strongly, a great book, I think. And finally, what about the history of all this? Well, one thing I should also quite conclude wrap up by saying uh, is that there's a common notion that libertarianism, whatever you want to call it, classical liberalism, individualism, uh, is not only a modern phenomenon, but an Anglo-Saxon one. There's a notion that it's something you find basically in the United Kingdom, in uh, the United States, maybe the British Commonwealth, uh, even in Canada, uh, but that it's not something that is part of the intellectual tradition of other parts of the world. This is completely false. Um, in fact, actually, if you were in the 19th century, the country where this philosophy was most highly developed was actually, of all places, France, uh, which is now the country which is the most hostile to it, but at that time it was definitely very much a French idea. The really radical 19th century things in this tradition, and many of the most interesting ones, uh, all come from France between about 1810, roughly, uh, and the 1880s or 1890s. Uh, similarly, there's a long German tradition in this. Uh, one of the great historical tragedies is that the German tradition of libertarianism and liberalism was crushed by Bismarck uh, in the aftermath of his great victory of the Austrians at Sedala in 1866. Uh, there's also been uh, exposed to this view in pretty much every country you can think of, even in apparently in hospitable places such as uh, Russia. Uh, and the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century during the Tanzimat period, for example. Uh, in India, uh, where there was a leading classical liberal libertarian party, for example, the main opposition to the Congress Party for some time, during the 1960s, the so-called Swatantra Party, which uh, uh, finally dissolved itself but has actually come to influence its former uh, adversaries in the Congress Party. Uh, and there are historical traditions in all parts of the world which, if you like, can lead to the same conclusion. That's why one of the points I want to emphasize is that you shouldn't think of this as having foundations. This is not a Western doctrine. It's not a uh, doctrine that derives from a particular uh, historical context or a particular uh, intellectual tradition, or needs to, I should say. Uh, this is simply a way of thinking about how the modern world should be organized, and particularly how the politics of the modern world should be organized. Uh, and you, know, you may think that's quite a limited goal, but uh, it certainly gives you enough to think about. So hopefully I've given you some idea of what this thing is. Uh, and I'll now show the floor open to questions from you. <coughs> yep. So, I'm going to go to the point you made about um, the fact that uh, libertarianism doesn't necessarily imply one particular form of economic arrangement, mm. uh, although it does imply it has minimal levels of coercion in one person mm. by another. And doesn't that, doesn't Sense of how you mix their labour with it or something. Uh, then, well, then to interfere with someone's property is to coerce him, and therefore that sort of tends to lead to, to capitalism. Like, unless you think people can own things collectively, it, not, not at all. I don't see how you can get, you can't get away from capitalism. No, no, not at all. Um, even in Lockean um, definitions of property, uh, it doesn't follow that you have capitalism. Um, you, you might argue that the more logical kind of conclusion from Lockean theories of property 
would be a society of self-employed people and smallholders. Uh, and that, in fact, was a conclusion that lots of Lockheed radicals did come to, historically. Uh, now, the question also there is, well, what, what are property rights? Because the question of minimising coercion, the question of what property is, are not the same thing. Now, now why do you ha have... Well, okay, let me go back. Right at the start, I said that um, libertarianism is not two other things. It's not free market conservatism, because conservatism uh, does share the idea that there are certain things which bind individuals which come from outside of their own choices and should do, and that one of the roles of government is to, in fact, uh, you know, enforce those things. That's why Peter Hitchens, for example, is definitely not libertarian and would you know, hate, hate, hate the libertarian position, basically. But you know, I also said that um, libertarianism is not the same thing as uh, libertarian socialism. Now, so I'd say the Peter Kropotkin variety, uh, or you know, the classic anarchist communist position. Why is that? Well, that relates to the question of what property is and what function it serves. Now, the argument essentially is that property uh, serves the vital social function of protecting individuals against coercion. But, but, you then have a secondary question as to what that implies. Now, that does not necessarily imply capitalism. For many libertarians, it implies that you shouldn't have wage labour, which was a common position, for example, because it means that uh, the, the argument, which a lot of 19th century libertarians made, um, including Mill, but also lots of other ones, like people who have now forgotten that Wordsworth, Donisthorpe, but also Herbert Spencer, is that ultimately wage labour is freer, obviously, than indentured labour, which in turn is freer than slave labour, but it's not real free labour, because you've surrendered a part of the property that you have in your own person to the employer in return for pain. So the argument was that ultimately everyone should be either individually or collectively self-employed. So in that case, the argument about property leads to a conclusion for a different kind of free market economy from a capitalist one. Of course, obviously, not everyone accepts that. So, can I kind of just respond to yeah. your point? So, you, would you consider coercion if I stole your suit and your belongings? Yes, I would. Yeah, I would consider that coercion too. And that's predicated on the idea that you're capable of owning suits yeah. and property and things. So I'm saying that you're, what you deem to be coercion depends it's, on what property rights you No, no, it's, it's not necessarily the case. Um, because suppose that I don't own the suit. I, uh, I am maybe... I have some other kind of quasar property family at least, or maybe it's not even my suit. The coercion involves, in fact, it's a non-consensual act. It's not, you know, in other words, you're taking the clothes away from me without my you know, consenting to that in some way. Uh, it's not, the, the fact that I own them is not really relevant to that. Even if I didn't own them, it would still be a coercive act because you, yeah. you have got no consent. So, sorry, so maybe I phrase my question poorly. What I really meant to ask was, doesn't your saying libertarian implies a minimum amount of coercion really not imply anything about what we ought to do unless you have unless you specify what what constitutes coercion, i.e. what constitutes people's property rights, their property rights over the person. No, not saying this. no but my no, you see my point is uh, I see where you're coming from. My point you're saying that you can't define coercion without the concept of property. I'm saying that the two things are independent. You can define coercion even in a world in which there is no property. Yeah but you, I can't take your suit from you unless you own it. Otherwise, it's not no, of course you my suit. Of course you. No, it's not a matter of ownership. Um, let's let's say there is something which is. Let's say we're living in a world in which. Um, and have you ever read *The Dispossessed*? No. Okay, great book. It's a science fiction novel uh, by Ursula Le Guin um, about a world which is basically a Kropotkinian um, anarchist society. So it's no private property. You can't say my hanky. You can only say the hanky mm -hmm. I use. Right. But you can still have coercion. You, in that case, you have the suit I use. And if you take the suit I use away from me and stop me using it without my agreeing to you doing that, that's coercion. There's no property involved. It's to do, you can have coercion. In, in, because that would imply your conclusion that if you had um, a, a, a society which has no property, then you might not be able to, have, be able to define what coercion was. Which is, you know, deeply counterintuitive. Yeah, but only you would probably be able to define it in respect of your individual person, not in respect of objects out in the world. Not necessarily. I mean, it's a question of what, it also depends on what you think property is. I mean, personally, I reject the Lockean notion of property. I think it's incoherent <coughs> in all sorts of ways. It doesn't make sense, ultimately, I think, unless you believe, as Lockean, in God 
And not only just any old God, but a very particular kind of God. A uh, God who has our best interests at heart, for example, which is a very strange assumption. Um, the, uh, you know, I personally think that you know, if there is a God, it's much more likely he's incompetent or malevolent. Mm. So I prefer to think that there isn't one. That's what my God yeah, I, mean, I, yeah. I mean, the, the, well, I think the, the view I take is, is the David Hume view, which is that property is an emergent social institution which appears in order to minimise conflict. Yeah, and and what the point about the Hume view, which I think is much more robust and is supported by the empirical evidence, is that property need not exist. You can have lots of situations where you do not have property. Uh, and property arises typically when the pressure of population on natural resources or other resources becomes, you know, goes beyond a certain point. And that's when you need it, because, Hume says, of two factors, the scarcity of resources and the limitations of human benevolence, uh, which mean that if you don't have property, you're going to have people killing each other. Uh, so in that sense, there is a connection with coercion because what it wants to do is to stop violence. Uh, but it doesn't follow the two things are inextricably interconnected. You can have coercion even in the same way where the property rights aren't specified. That's what I would say. So other, other questions? Yep. Um, you said the government and the state were different things, but wasn't the Roman Empire a state? Not in the modern sense, no. Um, the... Uh, Government is something, like I say, that has existed since old Sumer or the old kingdom in Egypt. And government essentially means that certain people in society have certain kinds of power over other people. Above all, the power to tax. Uh, and also, historically, the power to kill people, which is why you know, some people who love the state say that the executioner is the key state official. Um, but those are the two crucial ones. Uh, and also the power to command your labor to build the pyramids or whatever it is. So that's something which is constant throughout history. What is different about the modern government, which we call the state, uh, is the way in which this power is now theoretically, and in other ways, separated from actual individuals. If you went to ancient Egypt, where the state was all powerful, or the Roman Empire, who was the state? The state was basically the emperor, the reigns publica, as the Romans thought of it, was the, the emperor and the other officials who got power from him. Before that, in the Republic, it had been the Senate and the consuls and other people like that. It was concrete, actual people. The modern way of thinking about politics, which to some degree is actually reflected in practice, is that the state is a kind of abstract entity uh, which exists independent of the actual people who exercise power. Uh, and what we do now is to think, oh, that's what the Roman Republic or the Roman Empire was like. But in fact, I don't think it was. I think that kind of... Uh, political apparatus and the way of thinking about politics doesn't really appear until the 17th century uh, with Thomas Hobbes, uh, John Locke, uh, Jean Baudin, who's another really effective, great French political thinker of the 1590s. And it doesn't really come into being until, I think, until the late, very late 18th century when the Enlightened Despots and then other regimes, and Poland in particular, and also British regimes, create the modern state as we now know it. Uh, and the interesting question is, you know, can we get out from under it now that we've done this? This is a different kind of politics, it seems to me. Other, other questions? So that would be contrary to Paine and Jefferson and Arthur J. Knox's attempt to make government slightly more benign than the state, wouldn't it? I mean, they Well, in, in the sense that, I mean, it, it was, I would say the modern state is a particular form of government, and I think it's actually a particularly malevolent form in some ways. Uh, partly because of what I think is the worst intellectual discovery or invention ever, which is the modern doctrine of nationalism. Um, because what nationalism does is make people identify their own personal identity with that of the, the political power they live under. That's why we get yeah. big wars. That's why we get big wars, yes. Because uh, in, in the 18th century, basically, wars and kings did, and the ordinary peasant or the townsfolk just thought it was a big pain in the backside. Uh, and they certainly weren't going to rush out to the streets and celebrate and all volunteer to join the military the way people did in the summer of 1914. Also, they don't, they're not prepared to pay taxes. Louis XIV, the man who famously said, you know, I am the state, uh, which expresses the older view, by the way, uh, he never managed to get more than 10% of the national income. And if he had tried to collect more than 10% of the national income, there would have been dead tax collectors hanging from pretty much every tree in France. He had enough trouble with the amount he did try to collect. These days, we give up 50% of our income to the government. And we're prepared to do this because we think of it as being an expression of us in some way. Uh, Mills, John Stuart Mill said in one of the letters he wrote towards the end of his life that 
that would have been a big change in his lifetime. He said, when I was young, we all thought of government as being this thing outside and over us, which we had some kind of relationship with. It might be adversarial, it might be clientage, it might be something else, but it was definitely not part of us. Now, he said, we think of it as being an expression of us in some way, and he thought this was a striking change. He didn't welcome it. I mean, he said he wrote this about a year before he died, and he thought this was a very bad development, but he, he clearly identified it. Yeah? Uh, some people would argue that they need certain welfare institutions to actually preserve individual freedom, and what would be the libertarian position on this? Well, the argument is, this is the argument about positive liberty, essentially, or agency. The argument is that in order to have effective agency, you need to have certain welfare institutions, otherwise people are too much subject to random fate, if you will, the circumstance to have real agency of some kind. I actually think that's quite a powerful argument. You can grant that. The question that then arises is, well, okay, does that therefore mean that government and political power is what is needed to create a welfare state? And I would say the libertarian position is no, they don't. So the libertarians would maybe accept the position that there needs to be some kind of mechanism to uh, ensure agency for a minimum level of agency for everything in society, but reject the idea that the way to do this is by expanding the role of government, because that has the paradoxical effect of diminishing the agency of people in general. I mean, there is an argument that some people have made that um, you, if you take a little bit of agency away from a lot of people, but give a lot of new agency to a small number of people, then overall balance is that agency is, is increased. But I think that, that you can argue that may well be true, say, at some point 100 years ago, but it's certainly not true now. Uh, given the kind of size of the welfare state that we now have, it, you could argue it's you know, even true originally. So what is the alternative? Well, the alternative is one of the forgotten aspects of um, libertarian or classical liberal thinking, which is uh, voluntarism and mutual aid. People often think that the alternative to the welfare state is charity. But in fact, historically, most libertarians were opposed to charity uh, on the grounds that it was essentially another form of power relationship. It was involved condescension on the part of the donor to the recipient. Um, and interestingly, by the way, this is like apropos that, one of the most interesting things that classical liberals did in the 19th century in this country was to change the understood meaning of the word condescension. Because in the 18th and early 19th century, condescension was a good thing. So if you read um, Pride and Prejudice, uh, Mr. Collins, who of course is a fearful suck-up, um, uh, it says about Lady Catherine de Bourgh that she's got the most gracious condescension. Uh, and, what he, and to condescend means to come down with somebody. So it's somebody who's up there who you know, comes down to share your position. And that's all to be a good thing. And what the classical liberals did was to say, no, this was a bad thing, because it violated human dignity, basically. So you don't actually want uh, charity to some degree, because it has the same problems as state welfare. Another way of thinking about state welfare is that it's just charity. That's what it is, basically. So the alternative is mutual aid, where people with limited means pool their resources uh, and, by doing so, provide protection against contingency. So what that means in practical terms is things like the great friendly societies, the odd fellows, which I belong to, um, Freemasons, the Rechabites, foresters, shepherds, buffaloes, all these famous societies that used to exist and some of them still do exist. Uh, and Throughout the 19th century, these were a major social phenomenon. Unfortunately, they've been destroyed by, or squeezed out by the, both the welfare state and modern large business. Um, but that's the alternative, and that's how you attempt to provide agency to ordinary people. And the argument, that's a way of doing so on a voluntary basis. But it should be said that before we get there, you've got to clear out all the mess that the government has already imposed on us before we even know how much we need to support other people. Yeah. We'll also say on that point, if you're going to have open borders, a welfare state, yes. It's very hard to... I mean, that's an interesting question. In the 19th century in the United States, before 1924, the United States has no border controls. Uh, you arrive at Ellis Island if you're an immigrant, and they basically make sure you're not carrying a communicable disease, and they take your name and misspell it, which is why the United States is full of people with you know, misspelled names, phonetic, <laughs> phonetic spellings of European names, basically. Um, and then you just go off. So there's no public relief. So what do you do if you are an immigrant from, say, Poland or Slovakia or Italy or wherever, uh, and you arrive in the United States? Well, what very rapidly happens is that societies are set up, friendly societies and organisations, purely for people of a particular ethnic origin, immigrant origin. Uh, and so what you get, therefore, is free open borders and free migration people, but you also get voluntary action, which provides assistance for those people. Uh, and particularly, 
the obvious assistance they need in finding where to look for work, how the system to explain how the system works. So if there was, for example, the the ancient Slovakian Brothers Friendly Society, uh, which had, had had halls all over the United States, and if you came from Slovakia uh, and you went to New York or Chicago or Boston, uh, you could go to the Slovak Hall and they would uh, find you somewhere to live, they would tell you where to go and get a job, they would give you temporary assistance or relief and that kind of thing. So that, that's how that, that contradiction, but there is a contradiction now. There's also a contradiction in political philosophy about the way the welfare state now works. Um, the British public tends to think that the British welfare state is based upon the contribution. The basic notion that most British people have is that you contribute through paying taxes and national insurance, and that then at the end of your life in particular, but at other points, you get back what you've put in, you have an entitlement you've built up. Um, that's one of the reasons why there's strong political opposition to reducing benefits to the elderly, but not so much opposition to reducing benefits to young people like most of you. Uh, because the feeling is, well, you're young, you haven't yet paid in, therefore you don't have built up the entitlement. The trouble is, that's not the philosophy on which the contemporary welfare state works in either Britain or the rest of the world. The contemporary welfare state, and by that I mean since the 1970s, works on the basis of universal human rights and needs. It's supposed to be needs-based, not contribution-based, uh, which the British public hasn't cottoned on to yet. Now, the problem with that, though, is that that's got all sorts of interesting questions, because if it's universal human rights that provide you with an entitlement to state income transfers and welfare benefits, surely this should apply to all human beings everywhere on the planet. Why does it suddenly stop working at a national border? <coughs> so, you know, if you say, okay... Universal human rights give people entitlement to British welfare benefits. Mexicans are not entitled to British welfare benefits, therefore Mexicans are not human. Uh, that would be a logically correct you know, argument to make in that context. And of course, you know, uh, the more honest or you know, courageous uh, people on the pro-welfare state I would say, well, yes, this is true. And ideally, what you do want is a global welfare state. But there are some like Polly and others who think we should have a global welfare state for that reason. Um, but that's the point at which many people sort of like refuse to follow their arguments to their logical conclusions um, for various reasons. Yeah, right. Steve, just thinking about two different things that you said in your talk. One of them was about how libertarianism is explicitly uh, or narrowly a political philosophy yeah. rather than a broader moral philosophy, for instance. And then you also talked about. Um, Sandel and Elizabeth Anderson. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that maybe they think they're doing politics, um, but they really should be doing moral philosophy. So to say that it's wrong to have a market transaction over organ, um, you know, sale of human yeah. organs or prostitution or something like that is not necessarily, you know, to say that that's wrong is not necessarily the same as to say it's right for the government to prevent it. Yes, indeed. And Elizabeth Anderson does say that. Uh, she, she's much more subtle in her arguments than Sandel. Um, she explicitly says that she's not making a political argument, that she's in fact making an argument of moral philosophy. Uh, it's an argument, the, the argument that she makes essentially is one about agency. She thinks that human agency and the value of human beings is significantly impaired by making certain kinds of relationship uh, or activity market driven, uh, subject to exchange. So she argues, for example, that things like friendship um, and a number of other kinds of human relationships and things like bodily integrity are not things that you should engage in trade relations for. Uh, and her argument essentially is that this is moral philosophy. And she says it has obvious implications for politics, but she's not in the business of political philosophy. She's very explicit about that. Uh, and she also does argue that it doesn't necessarily involve politics. She says it probably does involve politics now, but she's open to the argument that it could just rely upon social norms. She says the problem is we don't have the social norms. Uh, but as I say, she's a, she's a very good philosopher. Unlike Sandel, who seems to think that philosophy consists of making assertions, um, which are not supported by argument. Uh, so, you know, as you may gather, I'm not impressed. So, yeah. yeah but given there's a very sort of philosophical um, basis, which is very good, and I've not really heard one uh, before on uh, libertarianism. Um, and you mentioned at the beginning that we're in a, in a, a state that uh, is uh, quite anti libertarian in terms of being able to manage. Uh, wanting to manage our lifestyles, for example. Uh, and I wondered, uh, as a libertarian of, of some years standing, and feeling over the years more and more hopeless and helpless, what, what you might see as uh, some achievable political objectives? Well, um, we, we 
you should feel hopeless because one of the, I mean, there are a lot of gloomy libertarians who say, that, oh my God, for the last 200 years it's just been all downhill, the state has just got bigger and bigger. Um, and actually that's, that's wrong, in my view. Uh, there was a big argument about a year ago in this, about this in the United States where a friend of mine, David Bowers from the Cato Institute, uh, said, you know, that this was the kind of thing that got libertarians in the United States a bad name because the argument essentially was, oh, we're all free in the 1880s and we're much less free now. And David said, look, this is ridiculous. If you're a woman, or an African-American in particular, you're definitely not going to think that you are less free now than you were under Jim Crow and in a society where women didn't have property rights and couldn't vote and take part in the political process and so on. Uh, so he said, this is ridiculous. You have to sort of like try and weigh up gains against losses. It's a mixed story. And this sparked up a huge argument. Um, I have to say, I thought David wanted to hand down and not because I'm sympathetic. Some of the people who argued against him were quite frankly preposterous. Uh, I thought, especially Brian Kaplan, whose arguments about women in the United States were just off the wall. I mean, I he really screwed the pooch there. However, more seriously, the reason why the change tend to think that it's all downhill is because they focus on just one measure of political power, which is the amount of money the government spends. And if you look at that measure, things do look pretty grim because most governments, well, the British government spent 10% of GDP. 1900. Um, and it now spends 50%. And you can draw similar graphs for most uh, Western states. Switzerland is the only major exception. Uh, Singapore is another exception, but not many. However, by other measures, the story is much more mixed. So, for example, I mentioned that 200, 150 years ago, governments took an enormous interest in what your religious beliefs were. Now they don't. Um, governments used to regulate huge aspects of our sex life, and now they don't either. They are now trying to expand into areas like diet and lifestyle. Uh, but uh, we, we forget that in the 18th century and earlier, there were all these sumptuary laws that governments had, which controlled in incredible detail what kind of clothes you could wear, what kind of hats you, you could wear, all kinds of incredible that laws about what kind of hat different social ranks could wear and who you had to take your hat off to, and, and how high you could get, you had to lift your hat and all this kind of stuff. And what kind of... So, only aristocrats are supposed to wear clothes made of silk, for example. Um, and there were grades about different kind of cloth that different people could wear. So some tree legislation, um, was, which also regulated how much money you could spend on your wedding or a party, uh, this was a major part of the legislative activity of most European states until the 18, 1820s or 1830s, really. So it's not a, it's not a simple story of everything going to the dogs. Uh, we tend to, if you're a libertarian, you tend to be more struck by the areas in which political power is expanded and you pay less attention perhaps to the areas where it's in decay or actually is in retreat. So then, to answer your question directly, what are the kind of areas where we might have political programs? I think there are, there are two major areas. One is to simply push back against these attempts to uh, you know, manipulate uh, things into changing the way we live and use actual coercion to do it. Uh, I think one of the most dangerous ideas at the moment is this whole idea of nudge, which David Cameron uh, is very keen on. Uh, libertarian paternalism is bizarre uh, you know, contradiction in terms, basically. Um, but the, um, so the, there's, there's, I think, strong room for simply you know, pushing back vigorously on, on those, those fronts. Uh, and I'm quite optimistic that we'll be able to do that, not least because the advocates on the other side are so utterly insufferable, quite frankly. Uh, the other area is the welfare state, um, and where I think, actually, I'm, many, most of the Libertarians are extremely despondent and pessimistic about the prospect for uh, reducing what we now call the welfare state. But I actually think that uh, the prospects for significantly reducing the role of politics in several areas of that are very good, particularly in education, mainly because uh, the uh, existing education system <coughs> is such a total mess. Well, I have another whole lecture on this. It's a mess if you think that its job is to actually give people knowledge and skills. Uh, once you realise that that's not its main job, you realise that it's actually brilliantly successful. Once you realise what its main the real purpose actually is. Uh, the real purpose of the contemporary education system is to take intelligent, inquisitive children and turn them into conformist dullards. Uh, and also, it's to, it's basically, it's a brainwashing system. It's also about manipulating, uh, basically deciding who gets which kind of jobs. It's a filtering mechanism for rationing out access to high pay, high status jobs, uh, which it does be really effectively. So I'm actually quite com uh, optimistic about that. I also think that much of the welfare state is A, at a breaking point in terms of its fiscal sustainability, but also uh, increasingly hostile. The problem is to put up an alternative. That's, that's the challenge, really. 
Um, simply saying you're going to do away with it is just going to scare the living daylights out of people who depend on it. You have to have, and you have to actually do in practice, as opposed to making speeches like what I'm doing now, uh, practical alternatives. And you should also be radical. That's the other thing. I mean, my own view, for example, in education is that we should get rid of schools. I'm a, um, I'm, I'm a John Holtz, Ivan Illich, Paul Goodman person on this. Uh, choice between schools is like choosing between which kind of coercive quasi prison like institution to send your children to. Uh, you know, we should be thinking much more rapidly than that. Uh, and uh, you know, that, that's the kind of thing I think we could, we could push on. And you should always be, you know, I'm always, the, the way to be, think about this is okay. Don't pay any attention to all these people who tell you that public choice means you're never going to win anything. Think about getting rid of the corn laws. Uh, here you have an economic policy which was central to the fiscal basis of the British state uh, and to the uh, economic policy of the British state, which was supported by and gave enormous income to the most powerful social group in the country, uh, the great landowning class who dominated Parliament at the time. Uh, and were, you know, they were liberal class, quite simply, and a small concentrated industry. They held a meeting in Manchester at the York Hotel to set up a, an organisation to campaign against them. How many people do you think turned up to that first meeting? Eight. Just eight people. Uh, two people sent their apologies, and they then turned up to the second meeting. You got 20 people. That was Richard Cobden and John Bright. Uh, Bright was ill, and Cobden was on travelling in Italy when the first meeting was held. Within eight years, they built a mass movement and they swept away the corn laws. And they did that by being radical and intransigent, as well as by making very powerful arguments, which persuaded, and which changed the whole political culture of Britain. It became political suicide to run on a protectionist platform uh, for almost 100 years after that. And you can think also about the way slavery was abolished. When the British Anti-Slavery Society was set up in a pub in South London, it was only uh, eight or nine guys in it. You know, people like Thomas Parkinson, Randall Sharp and the rest, who met in that pub in South London and set up this uh, uh, society. They campaigned again. It's an amazingly powerful, concentrated and entrenched interest. But they managed to abolish the slave trade in 1806 and finally in 1833 they got rid of slavery in the British Empire. So, you know, you should not think that the odds are against you. Uh, there's, there's lots of evidence from history that you can do things. Particularly if you're prepared to be radical, as I say. That's the uh, part of the... And it also helps to align yourself with, uh, you know, Large social movements or interests. Any other questions? Okay. You said that in uh, one of the conclusions of the Grand is that you must require any minimal grounds. Have you been provided standard for ascertaining what is minimal? What is minimal? Oh, that's a good question. I couldn't Obama say I'm a libertarian because I just have to think that Obamacare is going to come? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. I mean, one of the things is this, is that um, some people tell you that the to believe in limited government, but that actually is nonsense. Because everyone believes in limited government. I don't know, maybe, maybe the North Korea, maybe King, you know, Young, I don't know what his name is, believes in unlimited government, but, or Pol Pot, would, but, uh, you know, virtually everyone thinks that there are some things the government should do. The question is where, you know, where are the limits? So I'm sure Obama thinks that there should be limits on government. Very much so. He would be horrified at the idea that the government should be you know, using 90% of GDP, I'm sure. He just thinks that the limits are larger. So it isn't a question of limited government, it's a question of severely limited government, if you will. So can you define what we mean by minimal government? Well, there are two ways you could do that. One way is to say, pick some sort of share of national income and save it. That's what we mean. A lot of people say, well, so 10% would be minimal government. Certainly, they more than 25%, but probably 10%, that's a common rule of thumb. I think more, the more appropriate way, though, is to say not so much the size of government in terms of the share of GDP, but that the range of activities that are thought to be appropriate for the political decision-making process. Think of it this way. There are two ways that you can decide about how to allocate resources in the broadest sense of the world. One is for the decisions to be made by individuals, and those individual decisions are then aggregated through a number of mechanisms, through markets, through associations, to legal entities like corporations, a whole range of things. But ultimately, you have individual decisions which are aggregated to make a kind of collective decision and nobody really knows or plans or intends what that collective outcome is. The other way is to use the political process to allocate resources. And in some sense, the outcome is intended, although even there, there's a lot of unintended outcomes. 
Uh, so the argument should be, what areas of life should be subject to the collective decision-making process as opposed to the disaggregated uh, individual decision-making process? And the libertarian position, I think, to, for those who are not anarchists, because say, for those who are anarchists, the answer is, what should be any government? But for those who are not anarchists, the argument is that it should be only those forms of government and hence of coercion that are essential and necessary for the other voluntary transactions to take place, which basically means defence against aggressors, both foreign and domestic. So, basically, um, a court system to resolve disputes and uh, national defence, whatever you want to call it, something of that sort. Basically, a system of law, basic laws or framework, institutions and rules. Uh, and probably that would be it. So that would be what you'd be talking about. So those would be the uh, th those would be the kind of that would be the uh, you know, real minimal argument. There are some who go further. There were some who said there would have to be some kind of basic minimal guarantee of subsistence, for example. And that's but that has been quite a common historical position. To argue that while the government should not redistribute income in large amounts, it, there should be some kind of ultimate backstop public responsibility for ensuring that nobody literally starves to death. Uh, that so a minimum. That was John Locke's position, for example, and it's been the position of many others. So you can argue about exactly where you draw the line, but I think the crucial mechanism is to say what are the areas of life that uh, should be subject to the political decision-making process. And when you sort of go down the list of things the government at the moment does, uh, you can see there's a whole lot of things that get struck off if you find that principle. Uh, and you, you'd be left with what essentially most people think of the core functions of government. Like I say, there are some which are arguable, which some of them tend to accept that so, as I already mentioned, one, minimal state welfare, guaranteed subsistence. Uh, infrastructure is another one. I personally don't think that you need better government to do that. Some people think you do it for the efficiency reasons, basically. One that's difficult for me um, is uh, certain forms of public health measure, like compulsory vaccination. I think you probably have to do that to your government. Because the problem being that if you leave it to voluntary choice, you would probably not get the herd immunity back. So, that's a hard one for me, but I think you probably do have, have to have an element of compulsion in um, things like vaccination and certain kinds of public health measures. What so sort of practical mechanism would you imagine to get us from the point we're in now to that point? Well, I mean, do you imagine a bunch of libertarians forming a government and then gradually no, surrendering? No, I don't. Um, I don't. I don't no. think so. Actually, uh, one of the there's another whole lecture I've got this basically, but. One of the things that libertarians get very depressed about is they have arguments where they say, oh, how are we going to shrink the state? And my argument is we say, okay, well, you have this paradoxical view that the way to do it is to get power and then somehow destroy the power once you capture it. The trouble is, history and common sense suggest that ain't going to happen, basically. So I think that's asking the wrong question. The question we should be asking is not how do we shrink the government, it's how do we grow voluntary relations. So in other words, instead of thinking how do we get the state out of it, the thing to think about is how do you grow non-state forms of education? Uh, people talk a lot about the way in which the government provision of certain things crowds out private alternatives. Uh, the thing to do is to look for a strategy whereby private action <laughs> crowds out government. That's quite various ways. Uh, and, and another point also to realise um, is this comes back to the point about agency. A friend of mine, Tyler Cowan, is constantly making this point. Tyler says, okay, the US government in 1900 spent less than 10% of US GDP. US government now at every level spends about 45% of GDP if you add together federal, state, and county levels. But, says Tyler, the US economy has grown so much since 1900 that the 55% that is in private hands now is much, much bigger than the 90% that was in private hands in 1900. So the actual agency that private people have now in terms of effective ability to do things is much greater than was the case even with the really small government of the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. And so what that means is uh, that you can, it makes it easier for, actually, for people to uh, use that agency they now have to provide things privately and hopefully that's the strategy to push back what government does. So as I say, we took it the wrong way around. We shouldn't be thinking about strategies for shrinking the state. Um, it's more a matter of producing antibodies to the state, if you will. Um, you know, private action and growing the non-state sector in such a way that you actually push it back. But, um, which is 
still haven't got a whole different structure. So it's uh, think about what one of the long term goals, an example, one of the long term goals of the Libertarian movement in the 19th century was to disestablish the established church, uh, which in some ways I wish they'd managed to achieve. Um, you know, a lot of the nonsense we had published were not really moment, but we didn't. However, there, were, there was all this kind of campaigns to you know, win a liberal majority in Parliament and they would disestablish the Anglican Church. It never happened for all sorts of political reasons. But the alternative was that you both grew, if you like, the non conformist part of the British population, who weren't Anglicans anyway, and you also basically grew the amount of non belief. And so the result is that now, sure, we still have an established church. Does anybody care about this? Well, apart from the Archbishop of Canterbury, that's all he does. Not many, I suspect. So that's an example of the kind of process I'm talking about. Really. In that case, it's the growth, it's the growth of, uh, you know, let's say, unbelief, but you can think of that in terms of the growth of you know, all kinds of other ideas. But it's another example, a concrete one. Um, when I was you know, very young, I had, I'm not going to tell people how long ago this was, but I do remember that the only way you could get glasses pretty much was by uh, going to the National Health Service and got these kind of uh, black fra plastic frame spectacles that Charles Cocker wears. Um, and because I'm severely short sighted, I, I used to have to go through a huge number of these when I was taking at 60. Uh, and basically, that was the only way you could get glasses. If you were short sighted or had some other uh, side defect, you had to go to the National Health Service. Well, what happened then was that the Thatcher government deregulated the opticians market, the spec savers and Dolphin and Aitchison came along. And now virtually nobody gets. Uh, the state is now a residual supplier. And the bulk is done through the private sector. So that's a very small example of the kind of process I'm going to extrapolate elsewhere. Yeah. Are there any um, countries that you've held up as, um, as having uh, libertarian policies in particular areas? Um, the, the trouble is, there are some which are good in some ways, but not in other ways. Yeah. Um, so, and there are some which appear as attractive, but I, I have deep problems with in some ways. One of those is Singapore, for example. Singapore has a, a small government, it's spends like 20 to 25% of GDP. Um, it, and it has a welfare system which in many ways works very well based upon forced saving, but into accounts that you own, which you're allowed to pass on to your uh, assigns or heirs on your death. So not like the kind of stuff we have in pension systems everywhere else in the world, for example. The trouble is that's associated not only with the well-known social authoritarianism, uh, but also with a highly sort of paternalistic and restricted political system. So I find some aspects of that attractive, but I find the whole thing that's embedded in it deeply unattractive. Switzerland is another place, um, although you should not generalise this, because the whole point about Switzerland is that it's, it's highly federal, um, and some cantons are extremely libertarian. Other, like Vogue or Zug, other cantons, like Geneva, for example, are social democratic. But the great benefit of Switzerland, of course, is that you, know, you just move. You know, uh, you know, cantons are really, really small, you just go from one canton to another. If you want to live in a social democratic canton, you're going to live in Geneva or Berlin. If you want to live in a you know, more conservative one, you can go somewhere else, um, the Jura. And so when you can go to places where it's effectively a minimal government libertarian canton. So Switzerland is probably the closest one. The Swiss also have the, the kind of national defence system I like, which again is problematically libertarian because it involves conscription, but it's still the best one. Which is you know, the citizens' army model. Because um, they don't have a standing army, they have about 3,000 full time soldiers. But, uh, otherwise, it's just that every Swiss adult male has to be military trained and then has to keep all his infantry and his kit in his house. Um, you know, which is the system I'd like. The problem is it's, uh, it requires um, conscription, which makes it problematic for them. But I probably prefer to take that hit in order to get the other benefits that come with that. Steve, does it require subscription? I don't know that's the way it's done, but could it be done through a market system? I think it probably, it probably could. But the, way, the way you would have to, the way you could move away from the Swiss system is to have what they did in the 19th century United States, where you could uh, buy out your obligation right. and pay someone else to serve on your behalf. But there, that does raise all kinds of rather difficult moral questions, actually. Uh, and the other problem is there is a free rider problem, undoubtedly, which is that if you don't have conscription, the danger is that uh, the only people who will actually volunteer to take part in the military uh, protection services are the people who like to go away at weekends and you know, play with the soldiers, basically. Uh, and you won't have enough of them. Having said that, I mean, you know, 
there's no doubt at the moment, military, military goods, national service is enormously oversupplied worldwide. You know, the, I would, we estimated the IEA that the British states are spending about eight times more than it realistically needs to on national defence. And God knows what the United States is doing. It spends more money on arms than the rest of the planet put together. Um, which leads you to wonder what they're defending themselves with. <laughs> those marshals that call the program wants to have them as invaders. Any other questions? Well, thank you all very much. Um, and uh, for the, if, if you're, we do lots of things at the IEA, by the way. Uh, we have regular events, we uh, have publications. Uh, if you're interested in learning about what we're doing or hearing news events and you come along from them, I've got a sheet here with, that you can sign up uh, to get our electronic newsletter which will tell you about what the events are. So we had David Friedman, for example, and I, I gather came up and gave a talk here as well in January. Uh, and we've got we have regular talks. We typically have about one or two talks a week actually, uh, during the, the main part of the year. Uh, so it's well worth being on our mailing list to uh, know what's going on. See if you want to make a short trip down to London at any time. Shorter for you than me anyway. But thanks very much.